teaches Dana Delaney today on Pop Goes the Culture. Hi, I'm David Levin and welcome to another gorgeous episode of Pop Goes the Culture. I've got a great show for you today with a smart, sexy star of movies like Exit to Eden and shows like Desperate Housewives, Body of Proof, Hand of God, and of course, Train to Beach. Today, my guest is Dana Delaney. This one is from the archives just before she did Desperate Housewives, but we got to cover a lot of topics. How she wanted to originally be an FBI agent, her infamous Ring Around the Collar commercial, and how she got the part on Train to Beach. Here's part one of my talk with Dana Delaney. So let's sort of, uh, we can go, we can go chronologically, we can go a little non-linear and whatever. whatever. Yeah. So why don't we sort of, sort of make it easy and sort of tell me how you sort of found your way into this kooky business. Into acting? Acting, showbiz. Oh God, <laughs> so long ago. Um, I always wanted to be an actor. I'm really lucky that it's worked out. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to be was a, um, an FBI agent or a private detective. Um, and then I actually played an FBI agent on a show and I realized what I really wanted to be was a CIA agent because they had more fun and were a little more renegade. But yeah, I'm lucky that it, acting's worked out for me. What show did you play FBI agent on? It was on a pilot that never went that oh. Tom Fontana did. Well, you could do alias maybe and be a, be a CIA person. Well, actually, there, there's a pilot they want me to do at Lifetime playing a S. CIA agent, so really? we'll see whether I do it or not. Oh, that should be fun. Yeah. So what were some of the earliest things you did? I mean, did you do commercials? Did you go through that whole sort of commercial thing? Uh, yeah, I supported myself doing commercials in New York in my 20s, and then I did theater at night, um, and I did some soap operas. Um, my, The one commercial that I made the most money from was a Ring Around the Collar commercial. and. It's kind of become a classic in the gay world <laughs> because uh, the guy who uh, was my co-star in the commercial, evidently, he was the nicest guy. We did a play together too, Tom. He was this icon in the gay world because he could pass for straight and he was really tall and good looking. And <laughs> the dialogue was so suggestive. We're in an elevator together holding our laundry and I look over at him and I say to him, Small load. <laughs> and then I help him. <laughs> and then it's a whole, you've got rig around the collar. <laughs> That's all right. I remember that commercial. It was pretty famous. <laughs> yeah, I don't think about it. So, so how did you sort of, uh, you, you, were, you did the uh, soap for a while. Mm -hmm. I did a couple soaps. I did Love of Life, which had been on the air for 35 years, and I was on for nine months and it went off the air. <laughs> So I, I think I might have had something to do with it. Coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was on uh, As the World Turns, is uh, the boring role of the virgin. Never play a virgin, it's so boring. You want to play the bad girl? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how would you make the transition out of uh, the soapy uh, laundry world? Into doing more serious fare. Into the more serious fare? <laughs> Um, well, I always did theater also. I did Broadway, Off-Broadway, and I did a play Off-Broadway um, called Blood Moon that a guy, a guy named Nick Kazan wrote, who's a well-known screenwriter. And it was going to be done in L.A., so he asked me to come to L.A. and do it, and I did it out here and ended up staying, getting a lot of work. What was the first early TV stuff that you did? Um, I was everybody's girlfriend for a long time. I think I've come full cycle and now I'm everybody's girlfriend again. <laughs> I think I was everybody's girlfriend and then I was a star and now I'm everybody's girlfriend <laughs> again. Whose girlfriends were you? Um, I was Peter Horton's girlfriend on 30 something. I was um, Tom Selleck's girlfriend on Magnum P.I. I was Bruce Willis's girlfriend on Moonlighting. And then I got to be my own girlfriend on China Beach. Tell me about China Beach. How did that start? How did you? How did you how did you get the role? Was there anything? Were they looking for you? Were they looking for? Who were they looking for for your role? Um, they were looking for blonde. I know that, which I wasn't. And there's this apocryphal story going around about how I got the part, which is totally false, but I'll tell it anyway. Um, I my agent told me to go meet with John Sacred Young, who's the executive producer, 
on Wednesday. So, and I was supposed to read for him. And I, I wanted this part so badly because it was one of the best things I'd ever read. And it scared me. I didn't know if I could do it, pull it off. And I was trying to stay in character in the waiting room, which I used to do then when I took take it really seriously. <laughs> and I would drive to the audition in character and never crack. <laughs> And I was in the waiting room in character being very serious because I saw this, I saw Colleen McMurphy as Clint Eastwood. I decided that's how I was going to play it. So I was very stoic and squinted and didn't say much. <laughs> and I'm in the waiting room for an hour. And finally this man comes out and looks at me and kind of goes like this. And he says, are you Dana Delaney? I said, yeah. And he goes, come in here. And I went into his office. It was John Young. And he said, you're supposed to be here tomorrow. I said, OK. I thought it was today. So we ended up just talking for a while. And then I came back the next day and started this long audition process. But everyone accuses me of doing that on purpose, which I did not. I have no idea. So that was the, that was the part that was, that was uh, apocryphal, yeah. That, that you didn't do it on purpose. I did not do it on purpose. I would never have the nerve to do something like that. <laughs> it worked. It worked. <laughs> It was a long audition process, though. They, they could not decide. Um, I'd read many times. Finally, they wanted an old-fashioned screen test, which nobody did anymore. And I think I can say it now because she's so famous. It was between me and Helen Hunt. And they went with me. Wow. That's, yeah. kinda, that's, that's nice. That's a good company to be in. Mm -hmm. And they did go with you. Mm -hmm. So when, when they started doing the show, here you are in this sort of Vietnam era type show. Sort of walk me through the the initial pilot and the shooting of the pilot because I understand there were some issues with that. A little flood issue, a little. Yeah, it was very dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about that. Um, well, well, the first thing was they had a s seminar with real vets, with real women who had been in Vietnam, and that was daunting because it was so intimidating to listen to these women who had actually been there. And I felt, oh my god, what right do I have to play this part? And I sort of sat there silently listening. Because I, I sort of am a, a slow learner. It, I need to get comfortable before I know what questions to ask. So I didn't ask any questions. And I know that was the first day they were concerned about me, <laughs> that I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> and then um, ABC was worried because they, uh, I, I heard that they didn't think I was pretty enough. So that was an issue. Blind? I know, that was one of the issues. And then I remember there was another issue. So John created, as we were shooting the pilot, he created a whole scene that had no reason for being in the pilot, and it's still in there, where I'm sitting um, in a chair having a glass of wine in this black dress with makeup on, which there was no reason for me to be doing that in Vietnam in my tent, but just to let them know I could look good <laughs> if I wasn't wearing army fatigues and sweating all the time. <laughs> so it's just, she's, she's OK. And then I remember there was another thing of, um, they were concerned I wasn't wearing a bra. That was a big thing, which I was. But you know, God forbid, I think they saw nipples and they were freaked out, which these days they'd probably want to see that. They'd insist that there was nipplage showing. But at that time, they Digital were very, nipples at yeah, later. they were very concerned that there was nipple showing. Well, what happened when they, when they, when they came up with that? Because networks can be a little strange when it comes to their notes, can't they? Mm -hmm. what, what, what did you hear and when did you hear it about the whole brogade? Um, I think the costumer came, was told to come to me and make sure that I was wearing a bra and whether it was a, I think what happened, we ended up switching to the, a reinforced 60s type bra so that nothing would be revealed, the pointy ones. <laughs> 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 Probably better in the long run, anyway, in certain ways. Yeah. <laughs> what those, what, no, the, the 50s had the torpedo bras. Yeah, the torpedo, the torpedo tits, yeah. <laughs> can't say tits on TV, what? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, what did you think of during that period? I mean, it's kind of funny to think about it now, but what were you, were you like, whatever, were you like, um, yeah, I mean, I was very serious actress at that time. I took it very seriously. And so I was really just trying to concentrate on my work and not let it bother me and just be the character. You know, what would the character do? And, and I have to say, 
John would use it to his advantage if he wanted. If he wanted to, you know, it's me a little bit, he would be send, tell me something threatening. If he wanted to protect me, he would withhold it from me. He was, he was a bit manipulative that way. So what did he tell you about the bra incident? He was fine with that, I think, oh, okay. yeah. He was fine with he, that. He seemed to think the whole thing was just a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Because they, they had to blow up the frame. To look, yeah, yeah. He said, because he said, if, if, if they found it there, we'd have to reshoot the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I was wearing a bra. It's just one of those, you know, not form formed ones. <laughs> what, um, I understand also there were issues in terms of the mini skirts. You want to that, tell that me what? That, that they were too short? That they were, that the, well, apparently you guys got letters about the mini skirts that they were too short. Oh, from nurses you mean? Well, it turned, no, they turned out that they were actually, you guys had actually lengthened them. John oh, told I don't me. even remember that. Yeah. I know there was a lot of concern that we were trivializing the nurses. They were very, very concerned about that. What, 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 what happened? Well, um, there was another show on there at the same time called Nightingales mm -hmm. that was also about nurses that was a little more, you know, TNA, the cliche about nurses. Mm -hmm. And we went to great lengths not to do that. And, um, you know, it's one of those weird things where people protest before they've ever seen it. And I think once the women who had been in Vietnam saw that we were so respectful and really wanted to be true to their stories. They backed off and we were, we were grateful. John said you guys got some amazing letters. Did you get letters? Yeah. Okay. I still get letters about China. I get letters every day about China Beach. Really? Yeah. Every day I still get letters. What kind of letters have made the most impressions on you? Um, Not the ones from prison, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one of the best ones I got was from uh, you know, later in the season, we did a lot of stuff with um, post-traumatic stress syndrome and the vets that came back and had trouble integrating into society. And uh, my character was dealing with alcoholism. And I got a lot of letters from vets who, you know, were going through that at the, at the time the show was on the air. And even though it was 20 years later, you know, they were just starting to deal with it. And I remember one guy told me that he watched the episode where I was in therapy and picked himself up and went to the vet center and got himself off booze, off drugs, and he sent me his Purple Heart. So that was that was a big one for me. Well, how did you react? What was your reaction? Oh, I think I wrote him this letter back and I think it was when I it was it was when I was nominated for an Emmy and that I did not receive that year. I think that was the year I lost to uh, Patty Wedig, who had cancer in the 30-something, and I always said, can't beat cancer. <laughs> but <laughs> cancer. <laughs> it, uh, it meant more to me that I had the Purple Heart than the Emmy. It really did. Oh, that's huge. That is huge. Now, you know, you said earlier you felt like, oh, my God, how can I play this? I mean, most, I would imagine, and if, if I'm wrong, please say so, mm -hmm. but, you know, most parts, they're, they, they are kind of, you know, it's fun, you're doing TV, it's not brain surgery, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, you know, and it's, it's, and, but then you do a show like this, you know, or the guys who did a show like MASH, and mm -hmm. you get letters like that. Does it change how you feel about what you're doing or what you're doing? Yeah. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse. I mean, it's, it's a blessing, most of all. But I think once I knew the impact that television could have on people. For a while after China Beach, I took my work too seriously because I would read every script wondering what the impact would have on people. And so sometimes I turned down roles that were fun, you know, just plain fun and, and um, kind of kitschy and turned out to be great movies. But I thought, oh, but I, you know, I have to be careful because, you know, this, somebody could be offended by, you know, making light of child abuse or something like, you know, things like this. And it took me a while to get over that because I, I, I just knew it, you know, it matters. Yeah. But, you know, if you're doing China Beach or Gilligan's Island, what are the people on a desert island? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what are some of the things that happened? Did, tell, tell me about that flood. That yeah, happened. we had a, was it, it was a rainstorm, I guess, right? Yeah, there was a rainstorm. and. We were shooting at Indian Dunes, which supposedly had a curse on it because it was an old Indian burial ground. And um, it also was where the Twilight Zone ha accident happened. 
and this river where that helicopter crash happened into the river um, was flooding and it came up behind our set and it started to uh, rush into the set. <laughs> it was the jet set, the um, bar set. And everybody was, was screaming, head for high ground. <laughs> and I remember taking Chloe Webb's hand and the two of us just running <laughs> for, for dry land. It was very dramatic. Things like that happened all the time, though. Yeah. Something about water on that show. Um, poor Marg. They were <laughs> Marg had the worst of it. Yes, sir. Um, well, she always wore the skimpiest outfits because she was playing a hooker. and. And it was cold. It was always cold. And we're in the desert. We weren't in Vietnam. So they were constantly spraying us with water to look like we were sweating, and we weren't. And she had the worst of it. And then there was an episode, um, it was called The Unquiet Earth, which is one of my favorites. But she and I are in the tunnels of Coochie, and I have to do an operation down there. And we escape, and we end up in this river in our black pajamas, you know, Vietnamese pajamas. And I remember she started getting swept away by the river. I was having to pull her back. I mean, the two of us went through so much together. Oh my God! Well, Shelley, but the, the stunts that you didn't—that had nothing to do with what was going on in the air on, on the show. You just yeah. had to. But I understand that all that extra water sort of helped make the set look a little bit more authentic. Yes, it definitely got weathered. Definitely, yeah. And and John Young loves that stuff. He loves the torture. He loves the hardship. He loves that. The actors really, you know, have to deal with stuff, and it, it was very important that everybody worked together. And and you know what, it worked. We were really were a family, and we're still friends. It sounds so cliche, but it's true. We're all still friends. That's great. Yeah. You know, I'm hearing that a lot about the bonds that form between actors on a show. Mm -hmm. um, you're working, uh, you know. Dozens, hundreds of hours a week, it seems like, or like 80, yeah. 90 hour weeks or something like that. I don't know whether people still do that. I mean, we would, there are some nights we work 24 hours, and, you know, we had t-shirts made saying, you know, I survived this episode. And, but it was fun. I mean, I love to work. It was so much fun to see the sunrise, and, and then you'd all go off and have breakfast together or something. I love that kind of stuff. That is great. I mean, it does help with the bonding. How'd you blow off steam? We had a lot of practical jokes, the usual, because the subject matter was so serious. Um, Bob Picardo remembers all. <laughs> what would he do? What were some of the things that he would do? Well, I just remember one that he tells that I did that I don't, you know, I, that uh, these poor soldiers that would come on, you know, they would just be in one episode and they were pouring the blood on them and it's all sticky and they're having to play a soldier and they're really working so hard at it and they want to do a good job and you know meanwhile we're, we're just like goosing them and you know I'm stroking their leg while they're trying to you know and, and just <laughs> torturing these poor young men who thought this is my big break in Hollywood. I'm, I have my first death scene. <laughs> they're being molested by, <laughs> by the star. <laughs> That's it for this edition of Pop Goes the Culture. Next time, Dana Delaney talks about playing the animated Lois Lane, what it was like shooting at a cursed Indian burial ground, floods on the set, guest stars and visitors to Jaina Beach, including Vince Vaughn and Kevin Costner. Plus a little trivia, guess who originally wore Dana's Jaina Beach costume? No Googling. We'll see you then.